So good morning, Ms. Hales. How are you this morning? I'm fantastic, my favorite word, fantastic. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. How are you this morning? I'm doing great, doing great. Just glad to have the opportunity to talk to you about uh, the National Council of Negro Women, particularly the Washington section and your history and all of that. So we're just going to go down memory lane this morning, okay? Oh, all righty, surely. Wonderful, wonderful. So I wanted to, I just wanted you to start by giving me your complete name. I know Nettie Hales, but give me your uh, complete name. I don't use my middle name. Uh, I use my maiden name as my middle name, Drayton, Nettie Drayton Hales. Wonderful. And um, where are you from originally, Miss Hales? Georgia. I was okay. born in Georgia. Grew up in New Jersey. What, where in Georgia? Thomasville. Okay. All right. Do you remember anything about Georgia? About Thomasville? Uh, by coming away uh, very young, uh, I do remember Thomasville because my sister and I would travel there for a summer. So Thomasville... I think it's very deep into Georgia. Mm -hmm. But my family, my grandfather, my father's father lived in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And his family all left the South after uh, integration and all the, his children moved to New Jersey. I, I don't think now, uh, and he said he moved to New Jersey, I think they all scattered to perhaps Ohio, and then on to Jersey. I but see. We call New, Jer New Brunswick, New Jersey home because that's where grandfather was. But my father wasn't uh, one of his children that came <coughs> to Jersey uh, because my father had health issues. He, he suffered with epilepsy and would have seizures. And so... When he didn't come, the other fellas, uh, my grandfather's children, went to Ohio and places where they could get jobs. But my father stayed. And I tell people, I think also he had met my mother by that time and knew that she wasn't going to be able to come and he didn't want to leave her. What were your parents' names? My father was Almon, A-L-M-O-N. And my mother's name was Laura. And how many children did they have? It just was three of us, two girls and a boy. My sister was Betty and my brother was Edward. And we were the closest because we were just about a year apart, my brother and I. And where did you fall among the three children? I was second. I, second? I was middle, I mean, she was second, middle. My brother was the oldest, but it was like we were uh, Siamese twins. Any movie he made, I made it too. <laughs> so you grew up in New Jersey? Yes. What part? New Brunswick. New Brunswick. Okay. We call we we speak of New Brunswick and as home because my mother was an adopted child, but. Uh, my mother, because of uh, she being adopted by my grandmother and my grandmother's sisters, they all wanted to make sure that we were taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you remember about growing up in New Brunswick? Well, most of all, I didn't know very much about... Uh, segregation uh, because I went to school and all with and lived next door and, and played with everyday children of all races and so we didn't have any problems about uh, when integration came. However, how I met my husband because the uh, military was located just outside of our city in Kilmer, New Jersey, where they, they had a, a training for them to be go overseas. 
So Camp Kilmer, which is Rutgers University, used as soon as World War II broke out, my brother had to go overseas to service, and, and they asked the citizens to volunteer because your, your family members are somewhere where people are caring for them, and you need to care. And so because the military area was so close to us, that was a spot that they brought many soldiers to get prepared to go to New York to, to go overseas. And uh, we thought we were doing a lot of things because we're helping out my brother out <laughs> since he had to go, you know, because the war came to the country very suddenly. Right. So um, did you, did you um, go to high school in New Brunswick as well? Do you remember the name did, of your high school? Yes, yes. Do you remember the I name of your high school? I went from uh, uh, in New Brunswick. And after you finished high school, was that when you met, um, when did you meet your husband? I met my husband because he was based at Kilmer. So in addition to doing volunteer work at that time, were you working? Were you a, did you go to college? What happened? Yes, after? that's what I was doing. I was working part time and uh, no, uh, I knew we couldn't afford college. So, and I knew I, I wouldn't be, well, I knew I wouldn't be able to go, but we also needed, since my brother had gone on to service now, uh, I needed to help, be, be of help, not uh, a career. Well, I wouldn't have been able to afford a career anyway. Uh, as I said, now with my brother, because we truly were close. And he always wanted to see what he could do to help. But since he was no longer there, how could he help? So... I guess my saddest thing was the fact that we were no longer with each other. But, uh, Miss Hales, I forgot, and I want to go back, because the name Nettie, where did, where did you get that? Oh, How did you get please. that name? I, I wish I knew. Uh, do you think he had anything to do with naming you? No, but what, how, how the name came, I think it was someone from my father's church, and I don't think the name was Nettie, because that's a very old name, but... This, the mother of the church was Nellie, uh, uh, Nellie, N-E-L-L-I-E, -E, and, uh, and, and that was what she was called, Mother Nellie, and I don't know how they got Nettie out of that. <laughs> so going back to when you met your husband, um, when did you all get married? We, we we were married in, in 1942. And how long after that did you move to Washington, D.C.? I'm trying to think, was it, was it 42? Because, uh, well, we moved to Washington when, when my husband was offered a career here. He had, he had gone to college and uh, the college college as well as the NAACP knew his strengths. He was very much an NAACP. As a matter of fact, in my little town, New Brunswick, we didn't have an NAACP. We had Urban League. And, uh, the, but they had his, his, his fame in organizing and leading had traveled. And uh, so they felt if they could get him to Washington to be here, and established, well, Dr. Jackson was very much a part of the NAACP. And uh, he knew my husband very, my husband very well from the NAACP, the national, my husband at that time was very much a part of the NAACP. He, he's always been a, a leader in terms of organizing and, and that kind of thing. So Dr. Jackson, Jackson was the president of the DC chapter at that time of the NAACP. And so he knew my husband and he knew they were lo trying to locate someone to get a focal point in Washington for the March on Washington. The NAACP did not have a place that they could, they could go to. So they wanted Ed to come and find a, find a property. He didn't know Washington, D.C. But he got a building there on U Street. 
right right down from Lincoln Theater. And he, it, they all they wanted was an office, a place that Dr. Jackson knew exactly what the needs were. And, and he, and what he wanted was, if there was anything with the March that the NAACP needed to jump into, they would have a key place they could go to. And when we came to Washington, of course, Ed came ahead of us to, cause of, for the march to have time for it, but the kids were in school. So the children and I stayed until uh, the school, 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 the semester ended, and then we could come down. You, um, you know, it's interesting because you say you met him because you were doing volunteer work, mm -hmm. and then you, um, met and married a man who was very involved in civil rights and community work. Was that an attraction for you? Did you, did you want that? Well, I mean, where did the community service, that kind of dedication to the cause come from? I think Denise is part of my blood because no matter where I've gone, I've gotten into scouting and YWCA. I've always been a uh, community interest in what, what the community, and it didn't, I can't say that I can attribute it to uh, National Council of Negro Women even, because when we came, when we were, when, when I joined our Washington section, we weren't overly involved in uh, what was going on. But I think because I loved uh, Ms. Bethune is a leader and reading about her and knowing that she was a woman that saw a need and tried to meet it and uh, that it was an opportunity to be a part of, of finding other women. When we moved to Washington, I almost couldn't go anywhere if I was introduced. Uh, and Dr. Hyde, I can tell you right now, Dr. Hyde made sure that anybody by my husband having the position he had, I think that she felt it would give our National Council of Negro Women an opportunity to be a great, great part of what was happening. And do you know they they didn't uh, they didn't pull NCNW into it? And I don't think I'm not saying it, but I hope she did. I I, I hope before she went to glory, she forgave them for it, but she held it against them for a long time because these men just wanted to kind of run the program, I guess, themselves. I guess that's what she felt. But I have traveled with our local National Council of Negro Women a long time, mainly because uh, we have been, it gave you an opportunity. And that's why I'm so proud of our Washington section because I think when Dr. Hyde made the call, because her decision was that wherever you were to name your section, if you were from uh, Robin, Mississippi, so, uh, name your section, the Robin section. And so, and I love what Dr. Hyde tried to do to keep her, her legacy to us perpetuated, that we, wherever you go, start a section and, and, and name it where you are and we'll know there's one there. <laughs> so when you joined, do you remember the year you joined the NCNW or, or the years of your administration? I know you were president of the section. Uh, section. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to remember the year. I really uh, gave it the credit to Dr. Hyde because if anyone came to town, and they were going to be an asset to other women. Dr. Hyde made it her business to see that they were a part of NCNW. They say, oh, Dr. Hyde gave me your name and said that you would be able to help me. Uh, I'm interested in the National Council of Negro Women. And I would smile because I said, Dr. Hyde is bleeding up members for us. But she would know that they're in town and this is a wife of the new, whatever the new person was. 
and they should belong to the National Council of Negro Women, but she gives them my name. I guess she thought, figured I was gonna follow through with it, and I would. Uh, and so, but it's interesting. So when, when, when did you become um, president of the section? Do you remember in the years of your administration? Do you re recall that period? And, and, and even more so than that, when you um, took the helm, what did you, what had you hoped to achieve and, and what actually did you achieve as well, president? To tell you the truth, as you might know, I succeeded a very uh, effective president who is a native Washingtonian, and Inez Davis. And as a matter of fact, I think she helped to encourage me to be willing to serve as a president because she was a good president. And uh, I had come from uh, being a part of the presidency of groups that uh, were much larger than what I could even envision in seeing. And I felt if she was there helping me along that I, I would be able, because I wasn't that knowledgeable about Washington, D.C., but she was because she was a native born here. And it seems that the native born Washingtonians were so proud of their birthplace. <laughs> Uh, they, they were proud to tell you that because wherever I would go out, I, I would be so surprised at that people would say, uh, my name is Betty Smith and I'm a native Washingtonian. As if that was so, uh, the former uh, president before me was, a, as a matter of fact, she's remained that way throughout all the years I've known her. She has been right there all the way and uh, that to the house tops. I don't think we'll ever have a better president than Inez was. She not only served well, but she also, she also left a mark on the rest of us that you can serve, you can do it. What was it, what were some of the issues? What were some of the things that the Washington section uh, either under President Davis or your administration, uh, what were some of the issues that you all were um, addressing and some of the programs that you had at that time? I'm trying to th think because uh, at the time, I, because this is really the legacy of Ms. Bethune, what is going on that you can uh, get into and bring bring us into it with, you know, bring more of us to be a part of making it better. If it's no matter how good it is, you can come in and make it better. Ms. Hales, I was asking you, um, um, well, I'm gonna move on though to the next question, which is, do you remember any of the, you mentioned a lot about Ms. Inez Davis and of course, Dr. Hyde and and uh, Dr. Bethune, but in the Washington section, were there any other members that stood out to you during your administration? Oh, uh, well, when we were very involved with many different things, because every year we would be a part of the uh, big uh, program. It was held each year at 19th Street Baptist Church. The uh, I forgot what it was called, but we always participated and we always made a beautiful display for, and I can't think of her name now, but she always dug up so much, much good information about Ms. Bethune and had a whole collage of uh, facts on National Council of Negro Women each year when that program was held. It's no longer held. All the groups around D.C. would have a display. But what I remember so well was her information on Ms. Bethune, especially I was one of the very fortunate people from my section that we took a trip to Ms. Bethune's home in Maysville, South Carolina. And... Uh, we, we uh, 
I don't think it's South Carolina, Maysville. But uh, we, it was a wonderful experience for me because they were telling us as we rode in our rented bus that we're traveling the, where Ms. Bethune used to walk as a little girl going to school. And it meant so much to me. I could see this little person coming so far from this, well, I don't want to call them shanty type, but they were nothing but uh, wooden houses, little wooden houses that I read about in books where you see people sitting out on the stoop and they were just waving at our bus. And I just felt like, Ms. Bethune, I'm here. I'm here with the rest of us. We're going to keep your, our legacy going. And how do you think you, you all were able to do that? I mean, what were some of the things that you, that she did, or as we talked about before, that you all tried to continue? I mean, was it education? Was it um, preparing girls for, for, the, for the workforce? Was it families, um, voting? What were some of the issues that you tackled? I think the workforce was a big thing because after all, in the nation's capital where there are right at the in Washington. the senior rights and all because if the president if if the president's wife as a woman had not reached out to 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 uh, Ms. Bethune to uh, uh, see what it what we didn't have or what was lacking now that we do have now that we're no longer in slavery what 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 are some of our needs what what is it that we that could help us move ahead? And really, that's where where my part comes in. That I think that my thinking was, what is it we can do? And many a times when I've been in, in, in uh, Ms. Bethune's office, uh, not Ms. Bethune, uh, uh, our most recent person in her office. She'd say, right down below that window there, the ships used to come to pick up slaves, whatever slave they needed. And Ms. Bethune had said that one of these days she wanted to be between the White House and the Capitol. And there we were, that spot was right there, was a slave auction pickup. And to feel that you're a part of something that she had, it was only a vision. But if you can keep it going, if you can, whatever you can do to keep it going. Well, now, as, as a president, my goal, I was blessed in many ways. I have a daughter that was into advertising, and we were able to get a trip to this Walter Reed campus with a big, big to-do. And I've, I've got pictures to show how they had the welcome mat out for us and uh, our women from all across Washington was able to go there to the uh, where where the Walter Reed had which is only history now I think of the name of it wanted to uh, uh, well I guess part of the advertising for publicity since we use a lot of their product and so forth uh, to let us be a part of, uh, and they couldn't have come to a better group than a, 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 of African American women than us because we were organized. You know, it is easier to go to a group that they don't have to try to pull people in. They're already, and we also knew what our mission was. Our dream was Dr. Bethune's dream. Her dream was our dream. 
Yes, my 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 daughter in law is is an intended every woman, but I know she doesn't remember the legacy. But uh, Ms. Bethune, that legacy stands with us, and because I'm telling you, because of the fact that we do, we recited at every every one of our meetings. I leave you love. I leave you uh, hope. I leave you. Maybe I should have had some minds in that big Denise. Uh, That's okay. If it if it doesn't come back, don't don't worry about it. Oh, all right. We won't we won't, we won't get stuck on that. Yeah. All right. But you just said the legacy, and I and I want to talk. Was was the building purchased when you were part of the? Um, oh the no! I've got I've got a lot of pennies in that nickel. Yeah, I want to talk about that too because you, you brought it up. Of work to acquire that building we have, and we have moved to many buildings trying to get a permanent place. And so, when that building became available, many of us have given a lot of time, effort, and money in to uh, paying for it. Because, but I must say, the city did open its arms to NCNW in in terms of having a place that we could call the. Uh, we weren't necessarily trying to have a building as such, other than having a place. We thought I can tell you our Washington section. We thought we would be able to store. As a matter of fact, Miss Bertie Bush, oh, that's all she had ever dreamed about. That now we got a place to put all of our artifacts as we have events and and their artifacts uh, regarding it. So I, I wanted to go back. You mentioned the building on Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, which is where Dr. Height wanted to said she wanted her office to be one day. And before it got there, what, where did the Washington section uh, during your administration, where did you all meet? We have, well, we have met in so many places. The uh, first place I remember best of all was uh, in the Southeast area at a library. Now I'm not saying that that was the first meeting that I went to in Northwest we didn't have a place that was permanent. And consequently, Dr. Hyde was able to get buildings, for example, if a new hotel, if a new hotel was there, it would let her have space that groups, uh, some of her groups could, 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 I guess they wanted to get themselves introduced to as well. And so, they would tell us we could use it for our meeting. But I do recall a uh, meeting in so many different places from Connecticut Avenue coming around that circle. And, uh, but we knew that we had to get a place, but thank heavens, the place on uh, 14th Street that we use for the longest time owned by, uh, it was, uh, purchased by a sorority group. The AKAs had bought the building and I was with the company that I knew that sold them the building and really they uh, turned that building into a wonderful place, an auditorium and all of that. But in the beginning, we were only using a small little office space for our meetings. But when we wanted to get give events, which is what we knew that we needed to have a place that uh, we could also, which is what Ms. Bethune's house is all about down there on where where her permanent museum is now at the Circle. Ms. Bethune tried to get a place where we could use for our things. We could have things there that are people would come to for their events. See, Ms. Bethune wanted a place that we could go to and call our own. And there in her home city though, 
the the uh, I can't think of what they're called now, but the person that found the site where she was born, they have built a museum there. But in the meanwhile, how they could find the spot she was born on, and that and that was unveiled. That was where the uh, Fox Service unveiled her stamp. So what did the, what did the, how, what role did the Washington section play in acquiring the NCNW headquarters on Pennsylvania Avenue? Well, I think in the back of our head, it always been she wanted to be between the White House and the Capitol. You mentioned earlier, you said a lot of nickels and dimes and dollars, I'm sure, of yours went, went into that building. Sometimes, yes, as a matter of fact. How did the sections work together? Pardon? How did the sections work together? Well, we're trying to do it. We're trying to do it well, and we are doing it better than we once did. We have some younger women with the new, the new technology and all. They're able to use it. We're not always sure that people have all the new technology. And so we don't try to push everything into the new technology because our every senior person does not know how to get into the new technology. I am blessed because I'm with my granddaughter and her daughter who are into it daily. And they work or play there with the new technology. So, so you got to get into it. <laughs> I, so, but, I, so back in the day, you all had to type up the letters on the, on the typewriter and mail them out to the members and, or even call. I mean, how did you communicate? Denise, those were the days that I will recall NCNW where we were forever at the national office stuffing letters, printing letters, typing letters, information to go out. That's the only way the information got out was right there with our hands. Uh, and we felt we were the hand student. And Dr. Hyde made sure we did, too. <laughs> Was there a life guild uh, with NCNW that you recall? Oh, yes. and, uh, and, how did, and how did they work with the headquarters? Yes, I'm a member of the life. Well, that's, that's uh, the what, what capacity you join uh, life guild. Well, you can become a life member. Uh, by what dues you pay. We have just a regular dues, and we have, if you want to come as a life member, there's certain uh, specifications. And uh, uh, do, do you recall what the dues were, maybe when during your administration or your earlier years when well, you joined? Well, they have increased considerably. Yes, they've increased to the point. See, at one point we had the youth group. And they, they had a membership scale and then a regular membership. And then if you wanted to be, become a member for life, you could either work on a project to do it or you could, add it by earning it, or you could just pay it, you know, pay it out of life. I'm a Legacy Life member. Now, a Legacy Life member has to add paid a certain amount. I mean, for, for a youth membership or a regular membership, what is it, around 15? Well, I, I would say, if I recall correctly, let's see, uh, and I don't want to get misquoted by uh, saying it wrong, the life member might be uh, $1,000, or you could earn it by... We have something called the Life Members uh, event that cel celebrates uh, Dr. Hyde in her period as our leader. Because Dr. Hyde assumed a tremendous challenge when she stepped in the foot, 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 foot of leading National Council of Negro Women. Uh, and she was up in New York where the people were closer together than we are here. As you know, Denise, our people are in the county and they're in the city. And uh, so we do uh, count on uh, getting them whatever way we can. So 
you know, a lot of things have happened in Washington. You talked about the, um, when NCNW came here, it was uh, during the uh, time of the March on Washington. Mm -hmm. And we've had, um, you know, different mayors. We've had the 1968 um, rebellion. I mean, a lot of things have happened in the city. It became Chocolate City. If you were to think about what was the greatest role of the Washington section in the transition of the city, is there something that you that stands out to you that you think people need to remember? I'm hoping, uh, hopefully, that they will know when they themselves made the decision that what that they were going to make a difference. Because see, just getting civil rights and all doesn't mean anything. Those are just words of us just say, now what difference is it gonna make? Or what am I gonna do? Well, you had to have uh, determined that there were some things that you had seen that weren't right, and now you're gonna do all you can to make them right, them right. And not only you yourself, you were going to find as many people as you could, women, other women, black women like yourself, who uh, are going to be talking to each other. Because we realize in this city that other groups come, that they speak the same language and they understand each other. And we know that whether you came from the North or the South, you know about segregation in the North and you know, uh, and you knew about segregation, I mean separation in the North and segregation in the South. So you knew that you couldn't just say that it's happened now, that it's, we're all together about something. And if you live in Washington and you got a congressman right there and he's going to be looking for you to vote him back into office again and see Washington didn't have that, we didn't have any congressman. But Thank heavens, Fauntleroy was our key person. Oh my gosh. Walter was so much into civil rights that uh, not just being uh, representing, well, when we came to Washington, my husband and I, we had an event to honor Walter Washington coming in as a mayor of this city, because this city did not have that much leadership uh, in terms of uh, anyone stepping, stepping out and saying, so that people of color would know who to talk, come, turn to. I say to my son sometimes, how do we get to be called Chocolate City? Because there were so many of us here. How did? How do you think um, being involved with uh, NCNW or the Washington section, Ms. Hales, how do you think that impacted your life personally? I mean, you were a leader of, of the Washington section. You've been a lifelong member of the, or, of the national organization. How has it impacted your life and your views um, of, of just the world? Well, Denise, I, I'm, I have to say to you, it certainly has, and I thank God for that. But now, how my grandfather, I know how his children got north, but I don't know how he got from, from the country part of Georgia with no skills and no, no type of uh, uh, learning skills or anything to live in Jersey. And he, he did not have, uh, I wouldn't call his kind of work that he did a uh, professional work that he had to have, uh, uh, you know, book learning to do. However, he really was strong, a strong leader. And I realized that even at, at this stage of my own life that you don't ever outgrow the need to be leading now, but you need to know what, what it's all about that you're leading. Because how can you get, talk other people into being a part of if you don't even know what it is? And I can tell you my inspiration really is 
another black woman as myself who felt that she was going to come from where she came from and take many people on even further. And, she, and it was like saying, and Nettie, I'm going to have to count on you and other women just like you to do it. You're going to have to do it. And she did it by leaving us a legacy. And, you know, if we find out we've been left a legacy, we get happy. But when you know what that legacy is, can you do it? And if we can't do it, we should pass it on. I wanted to tell you I found it. And uh, the legacy. I think it'll help you. Yeah, it says, I leave you love. I leave you hope. I leave you the challenge of developing confidence in one another. Yes, yes. I leave you a thirst for education. Yes. I leave you a respect for the use of power. That's right. I leave you faith. I leave you dignity. I leave you a desire to live harmoniously with your fellow men. Yes. I leave you finally a responsibility to your young people. Wow, isn't that fantastic? <laughs> Ooh, what greater legacy could you be left? So Ms. Hales, if you could talk about your legacy uh, and, and the future of NCNW and the Washington section, what, what would you tell the next generation of women leaders? What would you want them to, to know or to do? Well, what I would say, Denise, and, and I, I, I pray that they would pay attention to it. You can do it to let them know that yes, they can. Many of us that have have gotten to the positions of leadership did not get there by wishing for it, that we had to do something or we had to remember something that inspired us to keep going. Even when we ran into difficulty, we, we would, uh, something that inspired us, no, you have to keep going. This is a legacy that was left to you and you just have to keep it going. You, if you can't do it, moving on to someone that will. That, that has always been an, asp an inspiration to me and an aspiration. And it was something that I needed to do. If you've been blessed to get this far along, that, that even includes my health. I said, Lord, you brought me this far. You, you don't mean to leave me now. Then I said, Lord, you promised never to leave me, never, never. And so that's what a legacy is about. Once you receive a legacy, you have to be inspired by it or not claim it. Don't claim it if you can't do it. <laughs> and today, Ms. Hales, if you don't mind me asking, how old are you? 92 years old. And Denise, I didn't tell my age for years until I turned 90. But then I realized you, you can be an inspiration to someone else. They're saying, if you're that old and you can do it, I can do it too. <laughs> I've, I've outlived the age of my mother and father. I think my grandfather made it close to be 100. But since my mother was adopted, we don't know her background. But uh, my grandfather, uh, I don't know that many of his children or grandchildren have lived to be the age I am now. And so um, this is my last question, Ms. Hales. And I know that um, this pandemic has us all shut in right now and away from folks, but you are still in a member of NCNW and the Washington section, I believe. And are you still active? I am, and I try to participate in whatever we are doing. And right now, we I must say, in all honesty, I don't think I'm wrong. We are growing. We have uh, young officers. Our officers are young. Sometimes the young people, they see a whole bunch of, a lot of older people. They feel, well, 
Those old ladies don't have anything else to do. But we want the young people, younger women of today, especially African-American women, to realize they have a tremendous responsibility to inspire the next generation. Because from what I can determine, our current generation is not as interested as we might have been, mainly because they did not have to face the problems of, uh, uh, what shall we say, of discrimination or any of that. They didn't have to go through any of it, but it didn't mean it didn't happen. And if you, if they were able to expose themselves to uh, facing that, that it could happen again, because this is the kind of world we're living in. We never expected a pandemic like this. We, never, we don't know what a pandemic like this is all about, but we're gonna have to survive it. And this is one of the things that I feel in. Anyway, we would be following the leadership of people like Ms. Bethune and Dr. Hyde in knowing that we must step out as a whole. We have to be say, we've got problems now, and we do. We have problems now because the younger generation, since they didn't have to endure some of these things, it's almost like saying maybe they didn't even exist and maybe you're just making up stuff and maybe you're going to be bringing it about. People will be thinking about doing that. No, you just have to come out there in lead leadership and show them what our capabilities are. This is exactly how uh, Dr. Hyde, uh, I mean, Mir uh, Bethune and uh, the public got together because the president at that time of the United States wanted to find out from his wife, you know this, this black lady, what does she say her people are? What are some of their concerns? What is it that they want? And we don't want to tell them nothing. Yes, we do. We want to continue with a better life for the next generation. We also want to develop leadership. All the leaders are not dead and died or sick. I mean, when we lose a Walter Fonroy, given it has to give in to his health role and all of that, and we just lost someone in Baltimore. Uh, you ha have to step up to the plate now. It's your turn to step up to the plate. So that's what I would like to see us be able to send that kind of message to, to this current generation, mostly because they are better off than their foreparents ever were able to do. They're able to do far more I'm not saying that I expect them to go out there and buy a, a yacht, a, 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 a huge ship that'll take us to Netherland, but they can inspire the young people to see what they're doing and want to. Uh, if you were to ask me if any young people person has ever walked up to me and said, can I do what you do? I can tell you what I did do. I have, when my granddaughter, great grand lives here with me, she was in an elementary school and she was wanted to choose a leader because of my part in the National Council of Negro Women. Her immediate thought was Ms. Bethune, and she wanted to go over there in Ms. Bethune Monument so she could get her picture taken with Ms. Bethune over there in Lincoln Park. And I was so, I was so thrilled. I thought, now, they didn't go look for Frederick Douglass or whatever. She didn't go looking for someone long ago and far away. She wanted Ms. Bethune. <laughs> I said that was my last question, but I have one more because you inspired it. And that is, what would Mrs. Bethune or Dr. Height say about a Black woman, vice presidential 
candidate for the United States, Kamala Harris, which not necessarily that person per se, but a black woman in running for uh, vice president or president because Shirley Chisholm did it as well. But uh, what do you think they would be saying today? I think they would be thrilled and they would be, but they would put the weight on those of us that are here to rally right behind that person and do everything we can to get out the vote. They would, oh, listen, we'd have campaign going now for, for getting out the vote to make sure that our people had their stamp of, of approval on that person too that we, in other words, are there and to let, and and it's something that that person will know too, that we are there for them. You are not, you're not alone. You you might feel that I'm the black person and I'm, I'm nobody's ever had this position before. Yes, but you're not alone. We're right there with you and we'll be backing you all the way. Whatever you need from my state, I'm gonna put my foot on the back of my congressman and put my back on the foot of the voters to tell them to put him back in office because he supports what we're trying to do. Okay, Ms. Sales, thank you so much. I think, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you want wanna share about your experience with the uh, Washington section or, um, some of the people that you worked with or anything that I didn't ask that you might want to add? Well, I just want to add, uh, because I'm so proud about it. Our section now, the Washington section, whomever sees or hears what we're doing will say that they want to be a part of it because the young people now, the younger women are stepping up to the plate and since they're out there in the general uh, public, they know many things that are going on that you might not know. Please listen up. But we, uh, we do try uh, to advertise everything as much as we can, grouping with other sections, not just our section, but so that wherever they live, there's a section in their area that they can hook up with and we can do more things together. Ms. Bethune and Dr. Hyde are so right. We can do more together than we can separate. 